Welcome to Chess, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you guys very much for stopping by. Um, so I figured I'd go back to like the beginning of time. No, I'm playing. Uh, I did go back a long, long way. So those of you that are really uh, affectionate um, about uh, the game of chess and the history will love this game. Um, it is between Paul Morphy, the pride and sorrow of chess, uh, and Eugene Rousseau. Um, he, I believe, was a visiting uh, French uh, chess master um, who decided to visit. I don't know if he decided to visit specifically for Paul Morphy or he just happened to be in the New Orleans area. It was very French at that at that time. Uh, and so, you know, there was a lot of French quarters and a lot of like, you know, French community and stuff like that. I think it still kind of is. But, uh, you know, he might have just been visiting some family members or something like that. And he just figured he'd stop by and play. But um, this is a game from 1849. Uh, like I said, at the beginning of time, a uh, long, long time ago. So this is one of the earliest known uh, chess games uh, that Paul Morphy played. Of course, he played a few against his father initially. Uh, and, uh, you know, he uh, he played a few uh, against a guy, uh, I believe his name was James McDonald. Uh, there was a couple of games with him. Uh, and then there were just a couple other games uh, between some unknown people. Uh, but this is like his seventh or eighth earliest uh, known game. And he was about 11 or 12 at this point. Uh, so he was still a very, very young guy. Um, so he hadn't developed into the, you know, 20, 21 year old, uh, you know, like best player in history, possibly. So, uh, but anyway, uh, for my people that are coming from the Philippines, um, I will say mabu hai to you. Maga nangu maga. Masaya akoma kiri kang muli. Hello, you lit. Appreciate you guys very much for stopping by. Meru ming salamat a king makai bigan. Anybody who is coming from France, um, I will say bonjour to you. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, merci beaucoup, uh, mes amis. Comment ça va? Comment allez-vous? C'est mes faits plaisir de voir mes amis. Uh, bon petit déjeuner. Uh, you know, it will probably be the morning if anybody watches this video. So if you guys are ready to go, let's take a look and see what we have for this game. And as I always say, my videos are chaptered. Um, so if you ever want to skip anything that I say during the intro and get straight to the game, I have it down in the description. Uh, so just for future reference. Anyway, if you guys are ready to go, let's roll. We do have E4. We got E5. We see F4. Now, something that you have to understand about the game of chess itself um, is back in the 18 and early 1900s, um, it was like very normal to play these types of, of games, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the, the gambits and the crazy kamikaze type stuff like that. So, you know, it's very, uh, it's very normal to play this type of stuff. Uh, and uh, it was also up until a certain point, if you uh, was sacrificing material or you were playing a gambit, it was actually considered rude not to accept it. Uh, you know, you were pre-obliged as a gentleman to accept a piece that was given to you. So that was actually kind of like a thing that they had, to, whatever. So uh, we do see pawn takes f4. Knight comes to f3. We do see g5. Uh, and we have h4, g4. Uh, and then we actually, as of move five, have the novelty of the game, which is knight to g5. Um, and this is actually uh, not uh, the soundest, uh, you know, move to play. Um, it actually gives black uh, the ability uh, to play some uh, some pretty uh, <laughs> some pretty nasty chess, uh, you know, um, going forward. Um, so what we actually see in the game um, is h6, which is the best move. Knight takes f7. King takes f7. We have queen taking g4, uh, and then we actually see queen to f6 in the game. And this does allow a very crucial tempo to be played uh, against the king. Uh, and this is bishop to c4 check. So before we kind of get into, you know, what was played as a result of this, if we actually go back uh, to before queen to f6 is played, um, you actually have the ability uh, to actually play knight to f6. And this does get a crucial tempo on this queen. Uh, and it forces the queen to move. So probably something that Rousseau was thinking about is the fact that he's going to be dropping a pawn. Uh, but after this, you would actually see queen to d or bishop to d6. The queen would come down to f3. Knight could come to c6. And you probably want to play c3 to make sure the knight doesn't have any penetrating squares. But it does allow knight coming to e5. Queen swing over to h3. And then bishop back to h uh Bishop back to e7. Uh, and the d-pawn is going to be pushed. And the problem is... You know, white only has their queen, uh, you know, out in the game so far, and their king is very, uh, very damaged. 
Uh, so that was definitely a line uh, that was very legitimate. Um, and uh, so going back to, like I said, what we had in the game, uh, we did see the bishop takes uh, or bishop to c4 with check. The king sidesteps over to e7, uh, and then we do have knight to c3. And as you can see, you know, this is much better for white. You know, they actually have three of their pieces out instead of just the queen. Uh, all they really have to do is, you know, kind of somewhat get castled, uh, you know, and kind of push a couple of more pieces and get developed, and, you know, they are in safety. Uh, so we actually see c6. Black has the same idea. You know, they don't want the knight to be jumping in, especially to d5. Uh, because you're going to be forking these uh, two, uh, man, I can't draw, these two squares. Uh, so you definitely don't want that. Uh, and we do have E5. And E5, it might look kind of crazy, and that's actually because it is. Um, you also have the ability to, to, to get some tempi uh, on the white as well as a result of this move. So after we see queen takes E5 and, this, and the king sidesteps to D1, we actually see king to D8. Uh, and this actually allows white uh, back the game, basically. Um, instead of king back to, uh, to, to d8, you actually uh, have the opportunity to play knight back to f6 again, uh, just getting an attack on the queen. And I mean, if you, of course, did something like rook to e1, trying to pin the queen to the king, you'd actually see the knight counter taking on g4. And then after you took on e5, the knight would take on e5. And you can see that you are down two entire pieces here. And the pawns are exactly equal. So this is definitely not something that you want to be playing as white. Uh, so like I said, we did see king to d8. Uh, and this actually allowed a beautiful tempo on black, which is rook to e1. But the game still isn't lost uh, for black. The game is actually completely winning for black. It's just black has to try to find exactly what to do in the situation. Uh, and then you'll be okay. There are tempo moves uh, like knight to f6 still. Uh, there is also d6 opening up uh, the attack on this queen. Uh, there is also queen over to g7 uh, or just simply d5. Um, these are all possible moves that get a tempo on white. But what we actually see in the game uh, is queen going over to c5. And queen going over to c5, it's unfortunate for a few different reasons. The first reason is it seems like it's kind of putting an attack on this undefended bishop, but the bishop actually has the ability to move so many different places. Uh, you know, you can always just retreat the bishop somewhere or something like that, but you can do what Morphe did in the game, which is the absolute best move, uh, and it is bishop takes d8. Uh, the problem with queen going over to c5 um, is this knight is double hit and it's only single protected, so it's it literally just hanging. So the bishop does take on g7. We do see d5. And as interestingly as it, uh, interestingly enough, um, you know, this d5 push um, actually comes a little bit too late. And if you actually want to pause the video and see what Paul Morphy does to take advantage of this move, go ahead and do so. Okay, cool. So... The thing that's crazy about the situation um, is if you just somewhat change your move just a touch to d6, this is actually like almost dead even. <laughs> so you're thinking like, man, I mean, just like I thought, I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute. So you're telling me that this gives plus 12 for white, but this gives like plus like barely anything. It's insane. It's very subtle, the difference. And I'll explain the difference to you in a minute. But... Like I said, the move was d5, uh, and uh, in this position, uh, Paul Morphy actually sacrificed his rook on e8 with check. Uh, and that is deflecting the queen away, uh, or the king away, uh, because, you know, of course you can't go here uh, because you're going to be looking at rook takes. And, I mean, this is just extra disgusting. We definitely don't want to be there, uh, and it's super mating. Um, so we actually see the capture of the, the, of the, of the rook on uh, e8. Uh, and this does deflect the king away from the protection of, of the bishop on c8. So we actually see a mating attack occurring now. We see queen taking on c8 with check. The king comes down to e7. Uh, and then we have the extra uh, accurate knight uh, takes uh, d5 with check. Of course, it cannot be taken because the bishop is holding the square. Uh, and also, unfortunately, you can't take this way because the queen is undefended. And because the king did step to e7, the bishop is no longer protecting the queen. 
Uh, so we actually see the king going over uh, to d6, but this just actually allows two separate mates. Uh, what Morphe played in the game was actually queen to c7 mate, uh, but you actually also have queen to e6 with mate as well. Uh, so you have a couple of different options. So like I said before, backing up to what we actually had in the game. After the bishop took on, D on g8, it seems like it doesn't really matter what the difference is between d d6 and d5 because you're attacking this queen, right? Well, the major difference, the subtle difference between those two moves is d5 does not defend the queen. That's it. <laughs> so if we go into a variation of d6 because d6 does defend the queen, it is, a, it is 12 points of difference. And I will show you exactly why. If you play d6, now, rook to e8 sacrificing does not work, and it's actually completely losing because the queen is defended. So the king would take on e8, queen would take on c8 with check, the king would come down to e7 just like before, but then now you don't have the ability to play here because you can simply just capture. Uh, if we do see that, uh, you would just see the pawn taking, and the major difference is the fact that the queen is now defended it is not undefended anymore so that is how subtle of a difference between pretty much it being even and it being just completely dead lost uh so it is insane <laughs> to think that just the simple pawn move so even though you're making a tempo on the opponent sometimes you have to really kind of consider do i want to all the way push the pawn or do I want to just lightly push the pawn? So it could be either e3, e4, or d3, d4, you know, because sometimes there is a major difference between the two moves. So you have to try to figure out, is there a difference? It really just kind of comes down to trying to make sure that you don't leave your pieces undefended at any point. The problem with this one is, like I said before, it's really hard to calculate that in this position right here, after knight takes d5, you will be in a position where you have disconnected your bishop and your queen, and now you cannot capture with this pawn. Uh, because you would have to see that pretty much when the rook goes here. When you see this, you have to be able to calculate, okay, I go here, he goes here, I go down here, and now I'm disconnecting, and then the knight comes. This is probably too big of a feat in the 1840s because chess was not as advanced as it is now. Uh, and people weren't always, I think probably Paul Morphy was one of the best tacticians uh, in the game at this point. So I don't really feel like there are a lot of other players that could have actually calculated uh, the nuances of these type of positions like Paul Morphy did. And so that is why it made him such a great player, uh, because he was a very tactically sound player for the 1840s and 50s uh, and probably would have just been the world champion. Uh, in the 1860s or 1870s, 1850s, had they actually had a world championship at that point. But as you guys know, uh, the first world championship match happened in 1886. So this was actually two years after Paul Morphy had already died. Um, he died in 1840s, uh, 18, uh, 1884. 1837 to 1884 was Paul Morphy. So that is that game. Um, so I went way back in the day. So hopefully some people appreciate it. Definitely leave some comments down below uh, if you did like the video or you have any other suggestions to make. Uh, I appreciate you guys very much. Merming salamat a king makai bigan. Merci beaucoup, mes amis. Au revoir. Makito tayo mamaya, and I will see you guys next time.